Hi there, friends. I'm Vasco. I'm part of the team behind the first global Scrum Master Summit. If you're a Scrum Master, the Scrum Master Summit is a place to learn, to share, and to meet new friends. We will have lots of live sessions where you can meet and network with other Scrum Masters from all over the globe. So make sure you check it at bit.ly forward slash SM Summit and the numeral 21. That's bit.ly forward slash SMSUMMIT21. We have seven amazing keynotes or more as we are still organizing the conference as I record this and eight tracks that feature people like you and thought leaders sharing their insights and knowledge to help you become an awesome Scrum Master. So once again, check it out at bit.ly forward slash SM Summit 21. That's all lowercase, all one word, SM Summit and the numeral 21. I'll see you on the virtual conference floor. All right, now on to the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Wednesday Leading Change episode this week with Omar McNeil. Hi, Omar. Welcome back. Good morning. How are you? Very good. Thank you. So uh, on Wednesdays, we focus on what might be one of the most recurring aspects of the Scrum Master job, which is to work with change. I mean, sometimes it's personal change, sometimes it's team level, sometimes it's organizational level. And for that, we need to develop our leading change skills. And that's what we want you to focus on today, Omar. Tell us a story of a change process that you were involved with and especially focus on the tips, the tricks, the techniques you learned about change and change leadership at the time that you still use today. Yes, yes. I want to start things off with, you know, change is hard. <laughs> it, it, it's hard sometimes for people to let go of their old ways of working. Uh, so it's like you have to show them a light. It's like any kind of transformation, you know, business, agile, organizational, it's the culture piece is always the hardest. You can do the technology and the tools. That's in my opinion, I could be wrong, is usually the easiest part. The culture is the hardest part. So story I have for you, again, coming from the federal space, another DHS client, uh, we were charged with helping them with a agile transformation. Uh, this is a large client. Uh, their CICD, continuous integration, continuous deployment pipeline was not in place. So software releases would take anywhere between two to three months, and the challenge was that we were spinning up new teams, new agile uh, sprint teams, uh, and how would we frequently deliver in this waterfallish delivery process? Uh, so, with two of my teams, what I realized is they would, you know, going they would be ready. They would the update everything, put all the changes in. Uh, they would commit their code, put it in. It would get to staging, and then it would kind of stop in pre prod because there was this gargantuan process to get from uh, to get to pro uh, to get to production. So after a sprint, a couple of sprints, I realized that okay, something is not working. We're we're kind of behind, and our sponsors are saying, "Hey, how come this hasn't been delivered yet?" Uh, and then kind of working with a few of my other. Uh, counterparts here in kind of asking them, have you guys hit the same thing? And they all agreed like, yes, we get stuck at a couple of different processes uh, part of uh, on the pipeline uh, that, that was currently in place. So what I did was a, I call it a metrics-based process mapping light. And I'll explain what metrics-based process mapping is a little bit later. But what I did was I had to go to each individual silo in the delivery path to understand their part of the delivery process. You know, my question was, how might I improve our delivery time given the constraints, the, the given the guardrails? So we had several silos. There was the architecture team, the operations team, security. And then there was the uh, approval process that had like 20 managers who had to check yes before anything could get pushed to production. So what I did was I built relationships with several members of these teams to understand how their process works to see, okay, where exactly... Like, you know, when our uh, release gets to you, what happens in understanding the process? So, for example, with security, what I realized is that they didn't have automatic testing yet. They had manual testers and they had to be scheduled because there was only so many. So what I learned with that team is that you had to schedule well in advance so that when your team is ready to deploy uh their code through the security that you can be immediately on their list. So I went ahead and kind of scheduled this out, 
a few sprints based on our, our cadence. And we were able to get ahead of the pack uh, rather than, you know, sit there and wait. We're, we were ready. Like, okay, we're scheduled here. Boom, we're in. And they had the available scanner, uh, the security people to scan everything. Uh, another example with this group was with operations, kind of understanding how they worked. So if you would uh, submit your, your change documents, they would reject them if you had errors or if they didn't include our architecture documents. So we changed our definition of done on the team, uh, our definition of done for how we would commit things. So previously, we would just uh, we would just basically say, okay, we're done, kind of kicking it over the wall. So we changed our process to include our definition of done for this release is that it must include architecture documents. The technical writer has to review our documents to make sure there's no errors, make sure everything is correct, and make sure that it has everything that the operations team needs so that there's no back and forth with them asking for more information. So we included that as part of our, part of our definition already. Uh, another place was the approval process. So once it gets past all the different, you know, operations, security, architecture, to make sure everything is good, it gets to the approval process where there's like 20 billion managers who have to sign off from different... <laughs> and 20 oh, yeah, billion from... is not a fake number, right? <laughs> it's definitely not a fake number. So there was a large number of managers who had to approve because, you know, they have to review everything, make sure it doesn't impact their piece of the, uh, of the network and everything. So... What I did with them is kind of like get ahead of schedule. As as I got there, I pinged everyone with you know instant message, email. If I was in the building, because we had several buildings, I would walk there like, hey, just want to make sure this this release is coming up. Please put your eyes on it. You know, here's what's in it, and I'll say like, you know, security's already approved it, so just want to make sure it's on your radar, so it's fresh. So you, as soon as you see it, as soon as you see it, you can just check yes in the box, and it moves through the delivery process. Um, so yeah, so. What I did, this is before I learned what metrics-based process mapping is. And metrics-based process mapping, it's a lean process improvement technique that you capture the steps, the actors, the key times, the quality metrics, and you can understand the pain points and the bottlenecks, and you can kind of focus on uh, that area to make improvements, like, you know, lead time versus process time. So, for example, with the managers, the process time to click a button uh, in uh, a system was like 10 seconds, but the lead time was sometimes days or a week uh, because we're waiting for other people to get other managers to approve stuff and stuff. So um, there was a change in how that was approved. Again, this is pre-pipeline world. So... There was a change there to how we improve, and I kind of manually did that, but afterwards it was kind of automated. Uh, also ensuring the complete and accurate accuracy of that step. So I use the operations as the example where uh, it would get there, and if we if we submitted and it was not complete and accurate, it would just die, and they would send it back and ask us to redo everything. But if we had to redo it, we had to go all the way back to the beginning of the process and have it go get scanned, go through architecture before it got back to operations. So that, you know, made we part of our, again, our definition of, of done was making sure everything was complete and accurate to improve that part of the process. Absolutely. Uh, for me here, one of the key parts of the the story that you were telling is that you as a scrum master, you were looking at everything that was happening outside the team and affecting the team's ability to deliver. In this case, it was different steps in the process, you know, the approval and, and reviews by different groups, but it could be something else. So for me, that was kind of the, the key takeaway. Uh, from your perspective, Omar, what do you want our listeners to take from this story as the, the key takeaway, something they can apply as scrum masters right away? Sometimes you have to take a step back away from the team and see what the process is. You know, perfect Nirvana is that your delivery pipeline's in place. Uh, you know, Nirvana is is, is a developer uh, commits uh, submits uh, pushes to production one release or one feature a day. That's Nirvana. However, most uh, agencies and businesses are not there yet. So you got to take a step back and look at what does your delivery process look like. How might I help improve? Uh, this process. You know, it could be, you know, automated testing, unit testing, uh, QA testing, or just, you know, test-driven development, uh, pushing that on your team. Just how might you improve the delivery process? Because that can change a lot. Because with the delivery process, you get faster feedback, and you also provide the business value to customers sooner. Uh, so I would definitely look at your delivery process to see 
where you can find areas of improvement. Absolutely. Look at the whole process to find areas of improvement. And and as you said, then do the follow-up work, the, the groundwork of talking to everybody, you know, keeping people aware, changing the definition of them, whatever is necessary to keep that process flowing. Thank you for sharing that story, Omar. You are most welcome. Leading change is one of the core skills we must acquire, but it is only one of the steps towards our success as Scrum Masters. Tomorrow, on Success Thursday, we will talk about how to define success for the Scrum Master role, we'll cover tips on how to measure your way to that position, and most importantly, how to develop that focus on continuous improvement that is as important for Scrum Masters as it is for teams. See you tomorrow. We really hope you liked our show. And if you did, why not rate this podcast on Stitcher or iTunes? Share this podcast and let other Scrum Masters know about this valuable resource for their work. Remember that sharing is caring.